really look at where the pork comes from. Get to know the farmers. I think that's really important as well, who they are as people and how they approach the product, I think is important. Um, and go out to the farms and see the pigs, have a look at the processes and how they're made and raised. This is The Crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Food miles, keeping it local and knowing where your produce comes from has become a part of many people's every day. When it comes to food, the importance and value of connections from farmer to chef can not only change the way one cooks, but the evolution of the culinary landscape too. For Ben Williamson, that connection has been vital to be able to push the boundaries of his own cooking. The ethos has led him to a career-defining restaurant where cooking over fire and the very best produce is at the heart of everything he does. Ben, in the last year you've opened two of the most talked about restaurants in Australia. How does it feel to have that kind of attention? I mean, it was a big risk and it was I was nervous doing it. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to succeed or if I was even good enough um, to continue to put things on a plate at a high level um, outside of that. But it, look, it seems to have paid off. And um, look, I've never been happier, I think. I think I'm in one of the happiest parts of my life right now. Well, Agnes, you were lured by the flame and cooking over fire. How, how important has the connections with producers been? And do you have some stories you can tell about the connections you've made since opening the restaurant? Yeah, it's really important. Um, there's been quite a few good connections that I've made since being here. Um, but one of the connections I think is, was most important and always has been was probably one of the first connections to a producer that we made, which was through Gerard's. We um, we ended up finding a pork farmer. Well, it, it turned out that you know it was Vaughan and Jade Schultz that they're the, the it's the son of a pork farmer who'd gotten out of it. Um, there was a connection through his father to the other owners of Gerard's, but it was um, he was thinking of getting back into it, and we were trying to find a, a true suckling pig because I think a lot of the suckling pigs that you buy out there, they're, they're what's really known as a runt, so sort of the runts of the litter that don't grow up, um, that are not putting on a lot of weight, and they're not super economically viable to grow out, and so they slaughter them early and sell them as a suckling pig when really it's just an underperforming pig. But um, to actually take you know, a, a proper, young, well-cared-for, brought-up um, pig, so it was something we needed to do, and he was looking to get back into the family industry, so the two of us together sort of formed a connection there, and he ended up you know, coming on to be quite a well-established and accredited pork farmer. So I think they just won gold in the Delicious Awards this year. I think they did last year as well for their pork. Um, but, I mean, that was one of the major connections that we had and it's one that's still enduring today. Um, you know, he's incredible to deal with. a very small, you know, family-run farm and, and look after. I think they even named the pigs a lot of the time as well, which, um, you know, a lot of people would probably be deterred by that and turned off. But, you know, it just, it just goes to show that the love and passion that they put into that um, probably products and um yeah i think it really shows and comes through in taste and in in appearance and texture and visually and all those things it's just an incredible product that's one of them what's the environment like on the farm for those pigs and what makes the eating quality so special for you yeah, so um, they're sort of not completely free range. So they're in quite large pens um, where they look after them. But what they, they do is they provide shelter for the pigs in each of the pens. So, you know, being out, they're just outside of Toowoomba in a small town called Bergen, um, not too far from Brisbane, I guess. But it's, um, you know, it can be quite dry out there at times. And so the the inside the pens is sort of not like rush, lush green grass that they're in, but it's sort of like a muddy, muddy clay environment. But the pigs actually love that. It's something that, um, that they're, they're, you know, bred into them. They cool down rolling around in these muddy ponds and that are in there and the, and the, um, the shelters, so they can get away from the heat and, you know, they have enough room so they can get around. You know, there's um, underneath the fences, they're just high enough that the young suckling pigs, they can get out and uh, the baby pigs can run around as freely as they like in between all the other pens and they always come back to their mother, of course. But it's, um, look, when you see all that and, you know, the 
farm where the pigs are it's very close to the house where the family stay you know and so they just get up in the morning they come over they look at the pigs you know if there's any issues with them they address them um and it's really just day-to-day run really well but obviously because the pigs are happy in the environment they're in and they've fed the right feed in the right quantities, um, you know, to, to give them a really balanced diet. Then by the time they get to a certain size and they're there, they're just really, really tasty. For me, you can just taste it. And there's other pork that we use, obviously, with um, Agnes and Bianca and across the other ones. We do use other farmers for other pigs because um, they're quite small, Vaughan and Jade. But for me, the flavour of their pork is just unsurpassed it's when you do a side-by-side comparison obviously there's there's comparatively texture wise they're great to these other ones but um yeah flavor wise they win every time and i think that just comes down to the love and the care that they put into it and the fact that they are so small that connection started at gerard's for you as you mentioned uh, while you were doing a middle eastern inspired food has has the sort of cuts and the way that you cook the pork changed with agnes from back then yeah, definitely. Um, so we used exclusive suckling pigs then. Um, so, I mean, look, there was, there's a challenge in that as well, being a Middle Eastern restaurant, right? So, you know, when I was living in the – I was in Bahrain as well, which is it's quite liberal but still is pretty heavily Islamic over there. And, you know, in the supermarkets, they have a part down the back, which, you know, we always used to call it the sin bin. It's like this um, <laughs> glassed-off area down the back of the supermarket that nobody else goes into. And then you go in there and all the eyes are on you judging. And, you know, you go to the checkout counter to put the bacon through whatever it is that you bought um, – you know, they'll pick it up with gloved hands, just disgustingly putting it into the thing. But it's kind of, um, you know, trying to find a connection through that to Middle Eastern food was a challenge in itself. And the way we approached it, we just thought of it as, you know, in Spain, they eat a lot of pork and in those regions. And the Moors as a tribe, you know, were in northern Spain and they were traveling around that whole region. And you can find connections regionally through that um, that work well with the dishes and the food. You, know, you couldn't just chuck pork into a biryani or anything that traditional it just wouldn't work well um so we try to find those connections which is good but obviously suckling pig we use the whole animal um at at gerard's whereas here um we've opted to go for a larger animal so we take the pigs at about we found the sweet spot to be about 60 to 70 kilos or you know 75 kilos at the most any more above that in the beginning we were taking them up to 90 uh, 90 to 100 kilos is a dress weight um, but when the pigs get that big, we found the the muscles themselves, you don't get any more growth. That you get a lot more fat, so the fat caps get a lot larger, um, which is great for charcuterie and things like that, which is where you would use a larger pig. But um, for doing a so – we use like a rack mainly, so we take the middles, so which is the loins and the bellies on the rib. Um, so – too much fat, obviously, the customer's just not going to be into it. And we wanted to get a really good crackling on the outside of it and not have that separate. So we found that sweet spot to be around there. But, um, yeah, look, over fire, suckling pig obviously would work really well as well. But I just find an older animal, better flavour, nicer cap of fat, a slower cooking process so that we can get more smoke into the product um, and more flavour from the fire. Uh, it, it works better for us. What's this journey been like for you cooking over fire? Has there been challenges and some successes along the way? Yeah, heaps of success, um, a bit of challenge, not too much failure. It's actually been really, really fun and a lot better than I thought it would have been. Um, I've always thought it would have been challenging, but it's really not that challenging when you get down to it at chords. I've always cooked intuitively anyway. I haven't been one to have a you know, stock standard recipe book that's in there that, you know, this product goes into the combi oven at this temperature for this long at this, you know, we, I've always veered away from that. I find all of that sort of cookery to be too clinical and obviously it has its place, but I've always been one to cook with instinct. And a lot of the chefs that are here with me at Agnes, they're chefs that have been with me for a long time, you know, upwards of 10 years plus um, through Gerard's and they've obviously been to other places as well, but they all seem to come back and they all sort of cook the same way as well. And so, a lot of the chefs that we have here, they want to cook in an intuitive fashion and 
it's sort of you get used to it really quickly, and then it's just the different woods and the different processes and how the smoke uh, works for the different products or the, uh, you know a different flavored smoke from a different wood or a different density or something that smokes lightly. Then that sort of becomes the challenge of it. But the challenge to me is fun, and a lot of the guys that work here would say the same thing. I think. Uh, you mentioned you, know, you have four restaurants at the moment, same, same, Honto, and Bianca is one of the other new restaurants, um, very much different to Agnes. Tell, tell us a bit about it and, and what you're doing there. Um, so I'd say Agnes is very much a destination restaurant. Um, it's a beautiful old building, but it's a bit out of the way. Um, so we always wanted it to be that thing. We wanted it especially to have theatre. Um, but with Bianca, Bianca is part of the Carlisle Hotel precinct down at James Street, uh, which is probably a very, it's a very fashionable sort of uh, cutting edge, high end fashion sort of area. So, you know, Bianca was always intended to be an everyday Italian trattoria for everyday people. And, you know, you could go there two times, three times a week and, you know, have great food still and have food that really hits the mark and satisfies, satisfies you, but not be challenging to the point that it's a destination place or it's something that you come for a celebration only. Um, it really needs to be that every day. Uh, because it's connected to the hotel, we wanted to make sure that it was, you know, anybody coming into the hotel. Obviously, now it's not that way because the borders are all closed internationally. But, you know, someone flying in from Germany or someone flying from France or someone flying from anywhere in the world could understand what the food was and connect to it instantly. That was sort of the plan for Bianca. Obviously, still use great produce um, and still make the food exciting. But, yeah, a little more every day, I think, is the best way to put it. Is there any dishes you can tell us about that sort of exemplify what you're doing there? Yeah, a lot of the pastas we do, uh, I think the pastas of Bianca are great. So we sort of make everything from scratch. Uh, we've got a pasta extruder on site, um, but we use really good quality durum semolina uh, to make all our pasta. You know, the egg pastas, we use great quality um, eggs from a free-range farm not too far from here as well. All those things we just take into account. Um, the pastas, I think, are incredible. They're really well made. Um, the execution at the end, I think a, a lot of people with pasta, they tend to, you know, the, the sauce doesn't quite cling to the pasta enough or it's too thick and it clings to it too much. You know, trying to get that balance perfect with the, you know, the Italians call it the manticato, but the emulsification of the sauce so it sticks to the pasta works really well. Um, yeah, that's my go-to, I think, which is really great. You know, the anti-pasty section works really well as well. Um, so that's got its own sort of kitchen, which is in the middle of the dining room where people sit around. And so, you know, we don't do a lot of cooking in there, but it's still very visual. You know, all the crudo gets cut to order by hand in front of the customer. We chuck all the oysters to order. It's just got a little more of that um, visual aspect. The chefs serve the customers directly by hand. Um, that works great. Yeah, I think those things are good. And, of course, pork-wise, we take um, the bellies as well from the same farms that we use in Agnes, and then we do a Roman-style porchetta, which is on the menu daily, which, of course, is delicious as well. When did you first start getting interested in, in food and, um, and realise that perhaps the hospitality industry was for you? Very young, I think. Um, you know, I remember being in school, I was one of these um, kids when I was younger, if I wasn't really interested in something, I didn't put any time or effort into it whatsoever. So yeah, it was becoming pretty apparent through school. I mean, I think every report card that I ever got was always the same thing. You know, Ben would do very well if only he applied himself better in class and all those <laughs> sorts of things. I think my mother probably got sick of reading it and they were both school teachers as well. So yeah, I remember there was a lot of frustration there. But, you know, a funny story with... um. You know, a lot of the maths classes that I was failing in um, in high school because I didn't want to do it at all. My father actually co-wrote the maths books, like the textbooks that we were doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I remember there were conversations with mum, you know, with him having an argument saying, you know, you've got to tutor him. He's failing all these classes. You know, you co-wrote the books. It's just a disgrace. You know, you have to tutor him. And dad was always, if he's not interested in doing it, I'm not going to waste his time or mine. Um, yeah, he was great like that. But I, I remember it was about grade 10 and then mum was saying, you know, you've got to do something with yourself. You know, what do you enjoy? What What are you going to, if, if you're not going to do well academically, what are you going to put your 
um, efforts into because you can't not have a career. And I remember I just really enjoyed cooking. My grandmother was an incredible cook. And, you know, whenever I was sick or away from school or I couldn't go for whatever reason, I'd always go to my grandmother's house because both my parents were teaching. So, um, and she would just cook all day long. And I remember I really enjoyed that. I used to enjoy getting in the kitchen. It was very much like old school stuff, you know, scones and cakes and chicken soup and all those sorts of things. But um, I think that's sort of where it started. And then I remember saying I wanted, I, I enjoyed cooking and it was something I'd be interested in doing. And then all of a sudden, you know, I put all my effort into the home ec classes. I started getting A's in all that area, although it's probably quite easy to get an A in home ec when <laughs> you're in grade 10. But um, yeah, I mean, that was it. And then I started washing dishes at a local place close to my, my parents' house where I was and they offered me apprenticeship and then I took that on, um, spent four years there building up uh, before I moved to Sydney. And, yeah, I guess that's where it started. I think it was one of those things that, like a lot of chefs will tell you, they they sort of fell into it. It wasn't a choice. It was something that it was just a matter of they needed to do something and they needed to earn some money and, and it was something that was easy and an offer. And then once you're in there and you start doing it, I just fell in love. I fell in love with the energy of kitchens. Um, I think deep down I'm probably a bit of an adrenaline junkie and, you know, I love that stress of service, you know, like a really busy service in a restaurant is just something I thrive on and I can't imagine doing anything else. You mentioned after your apprenticeship, you moved to Sydney from WA. Tell us about that period of time. What were the really integral moments that um, were pivotal in uh, your development as a chef? So Sydney, I think back then I was in my early 20s and I was probably still more interested in partying than I was in the kitchen. <laughs> it was just a means to an end. Um, yeah, I got all that stuff out of the way very early in my life. It was, <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty rogue back then, but it was um, – Look, I ended up, I worked around a few cafes in Surrey Hills when I first got there. Um, didn't really put much into it. And then I ended up at the, um, used to be the Ritz Carlton in Double Bay. I think it's the Stanford Plaza now. So there was a restaurant. Great chefs. Um, yeah, and that sort of got me inspired. And then I got excited for, for you know, for the push of the kitchens in that way. Um yeah, but I think towards the end of that, I started getting a little bit burnt out, I guess, and I was a bit over all the partying lifestyle that I was leading and I needed a change and I needed to do something different, which is when um, it was actually an ex-boyfriend of my older sister's. He used to be an in-flight chef for ANSET Australia um, before that collapsed and he had taken up a job in Bahrain working for the Gulf Air, which is an airline that the management of ANSET ended up going over there to run that and they implemented the thing. And he gave me a call and said, um, do you want to come over and do this for a while? We've got some recruiters coming in there in a couple of weeks um, to go and talk to them and, and see if you want to do it. And I went, shit, yeah, why not? I've got nothing else to lose. And that was the next step, I guess, which was very different to cooking in kitchens. Well, tell us about your experiences in the Middle East. Is there any um, events or dinners that you can tell us about that um, that surprised you over there? Yeah. So, well, I mean, the job, it sounds very glamorous, but really it was pretty straightforward and simple. So we used to go and design menus um, on the ground. So you'd imagine when you're in, on the plane cooking on board, there's not a lot you can do. There's only really two, three closed ovens and, um, you know, an open – sort of boiler which is about 500 mils and that's all there was so you know you plan a good pantry and you seal everything off on the ground all the things you need to do there and then put it together online so i mean that was it was pretty simple it was great for travel i enjoyed the traveling and there was some pretty big events that we did um i remember going to represent the company in a big um uh, what would you call it like in a big entertainment precinct in melbourne and it was all about you know like a trade show i guess they were trying to sell the dream and you know i met a couple of the guys who are still friends to this day uh who were leading sales in australia for the company travis armstrong he's a great guy and a few others but we sort of hooked up in this train show where we're standing around all day you know trying to sell to all these other people how the in-flight um chef experience has revolutionized the flying and you know travis travis and i i think every night after the show was finished we went out and got absolutely belted in melbourne and came came back just completely hung over trying to sell this dream to these people it was quite funny but i mean that was just one of the things that we do i remember 
you know, being involved in the wine selection for on board the flights where, you know, we'd walk into this room and there would have been, you know, these French wine producers uh, and, you know, literally a thousand bottles of wine to taste. So there was so much. It was insane how many, and you know, going around there. By the time we got halfway down one of the sides of the table that everyone was laid out, we were completely fatigued. We couldn't do any more. Like it was, uh, yeah, it, it was fun. There were a lot of those sort of things that we did. You know, the international travel was amazing, going to different countries. And, um, you know, I didn't host too many events massively in that way, but it was, um, yeah, it was a great travel experience. Well, plain food doesn't have a, a very good rap, but uh, it's a little bit different at the pointy end. Can you tell us about some of the f- creations that, that work on a plane? Yeah, so the funny thing is, is acidities, um, your palate under pressure, it registers acidity in, in a different way. So um, things that are slightly acidic seem extremely acidic when you're in the plane. So you have to pair a lot of those sort of flavours back. Um, you know, you have to salt things a little more assertively than you would on ground. It, it's a funny thing. You wouldn't think there'd be any difference, but, yeah, your palate does work in a different way on the plane. That And that goes to the wine selections as well. You know, if you've got quite an acidic Riesling and you put it up there, it's going to taste like battery acid when you're, when you're flying um, at 30,000 feet. So, yeah, just trying to adjust those. I mean... There's a lot of stuff we did. It was, you know, mainly pre-sealed meats with a really great made French-style sauce or, you know, we had an Arabic menu as well that we do where it would be things like biryanis and um, traditional Arabic sweets. Um, yeah, those sort of things work pretty well as well. I mean, most of the time in the flights, especially on the Europe trips, it would be, you know, distant relatives of the royal family at Bahrain that would be on there. So they'd want to eat those sort of things. And then businessmen were the other side. So it was, you know, what would international businessmen want to eat? And then what would the royal family, extended royal family of Bahrain want to eat or wealthy Bahrainis? Um, so trying to balance those two things was was the challenge. What did you take away from your experiences uh, in the Middle East and, and working with this company? Yeah, being exposed to so many different cultures was the thing that I took the most from it. And I think I learned a lot from that. I don't think I learned tremendously a lot to do with skilled cooking over there. It was mainly just cultural differences. Um, you know, the building we were living in, I think I told you in the last podcast we did, but it was all the different um, in-flight chefs are all staying in the same building block with us. And there were a couple of different ones as well, but you're talking about 50, 60 different chefs from different regions of the world all together. And all of them, you know, it was very much an open house policy. And when you get into the kitchens, their own kitchens, and you're cooking lunch with them or you host them for lunch and, you know, you see what Maltese, real Maltese food's like and real Moroccan food and uh, proper home cooked French food, like all these guys doing doing that. That that's probably the thing that I took from it the most is just that exposure to all these different cultures from all around the globe. Um, yeah, you get quite informed about you know what's what. The evolution of Brisbane's food culture has been quite amazing in the last decade, and you've been a really big part of that. First with Gerard's, and now with Agnes and Bianca. Tell us a bit about the business, you know, Brisbane's food culture and, and how you see it. Um, yeah, when I first came here, it was mainly, you know, it was the steakhouse state. You know, there was a – on every street corner, there was a massive steakhouse and they were the restaurants that were booming. I mean, for a little while there, I was head chef at Cha Cha Cha, which used to be Brisbane's biggest steakhouse restaurant. And I think it was the restaurant that a lot of uh, Brisbane would – you know, it would be the gauge of how the restaurant industry was doing because of how busy Cha 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 was. You know, if Cha 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 was quiet, everyone was quiet. If Cha 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 was really busy, then everybody was going to be busy. It was the first place to fill up and the first place to drop the numbers. But it's, um, you know, now I think there's an appetite for a different type of food. I think there's an appetite for um, – for different dining experiences, you know, a lot of the time it was the street front places that would do really well. You know, and if you were on the street in James Street and all the, it's all open up and, you know, you're there to be seen and you're there to be eating the right things and that was sort of what the Brisbane scene was like, whereas now 
it's all these different little pockets of places that are hidden away that have their own vibe. You know, a lot of people have said that Agnes feels like you're in a New York loft somewhere when you're dining here, um, which wasn't intentional on our part, but we did want people to walk in and feel like they were going to be transported somewhere else that they weren't here in Brisbane. It doesn't feel like a Brisbane restaurant per se. You know, it is quite dark and the tones are very dark and uh, that's not something that you would have seen before here. Um, you know, Gerard's was another one, like the precinct where Gerard's is... It was a very unconventional restaurant, especially for the place that it was. Um, but obviously, the way it took off, look, the first six months of Gerard's, I remember, were reasonably quiet. Not a, lot of, not a lot of people understood what we were until the media started getting behind us, um, which was extremely helpful as well. I think a lot of that probably saved the business. But, um, yeah, I think there's an appetite for dining that's different now um, and they're – more open to people that are pushing the envelope. You've got quite a um, big restaurant stable there now with um, four restaurants. It's been quite a busy year for you. Uh, well, what's it like managing multiple sites with such different offerings? Uh, it's really hard to stay on top of everything, <laughs> firstly, which would be quite obvious, I'd say. But um, look, the hardest thing was probably separating away from Agnes. Agnes is very much my baby and I'm very connected to it emotionally. Um, so trying to step away from here and have that trust that things are going to be run well because I can't be here every day of the week, um, that was a big one. Um, you know, when I took over a share of Honto and Same Same, they were very much established already. So, you know, getting into those kitchens and dealing with the chefs that are in there and trying to make them understand that, you know, I'm coming in there to help them, not to change what they're doing or to tell them that things are wrong. I mean, dealing with chefs in that way, they're very, chefs are very proud, obviously, of what they do and they're quite defensive um, in the same way. But I, I think that's the biggest challenge and the diversity between them. I've got a pretty good understanding of them all and why they work well. And I think more importantly, you know, I'm in my 40s now. So, you know, I'm not a spring chicken and I can't be pushing on on the line every day as much as I used to. You know, my body doesn't bounce back in the same way. So it's, you know, working on the business has been really exciting and having the ability to look at them from the outside at the big picture rather than being in there in the trenches pushing on has, has been great. And, yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. How do you get the best out of your chefs? What sort of role do you play and what some of the techniques you have? Yeah, I think you've got to keep them inspired. That's the big one. Um, you know, you've got to get behind them and keep pushing the inspiration. You've got to give them the tools, uh, you know, from my – I've had a lot of experience, which is probably the thing that I've got over the rest of them, but it's, you know, enabling them – to see things for what they are and being able to implement systems to make things easier for the staff that are under them, um, make things easier for themselves, but also keeping them inspired and giving them enough drive to keep pushing and keep pushing forward and to keep pushing the envelope as much as they can. Um, I, th I think that's the key. You mentioned how important uh, great produce is um, for all of your restaurants, but particularly at Agnes cooking over fire and keeping things simple. Is there, is there a um, pork dish or two that you can take us through that you've had on the menu that um, is quite different for your style of cooking? Hmm, That's a good question. So well, I guess the simple answer to it is there's two pork dishes that are prominent that we do at the moment. Um one of them, as I said, is those, it's sort of like a, what the Spanish would call a chuleton. So it's a, your standard rack of pork that you would look at, but with the belly still on there attached to the bone. So uh, much longer, sort of like a pork tomahawk, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, you know, that's cooked very slowly over the fire, as I said. And so that, you know, your more conventional pork cutlet with the crackling on the outside, but with a really good smoky flavour to it. And obviously we dry age the pork as well, um, which is something I probably didn't touch on before. All the meat that we do here is dry aged. Um, we don't use wet aged meat here unless we really have to. If anything goes wrong with any of the products, but it's um, the flavour that you get from that, especially in pork, I think it's something that most people haven't experienced. And I think they should, you know, when you taste the pork when it's been dry aged at two weeks, the flavour is incredible and really sweet. Um, you know, but here we push it. I mean, I've had pork here that's been dry aged, which was in the beginning when we had the lockdown. It was unintentional, but it ended up getting up to 92 days dry aged, which is, um, you know, it's massive even for a piece of beef, let alone pork. And honestly, we cut into it and 
I remember saying to one of the chefs that was here with me at the time, it's like, you know, I have no idea what this is going to taste like, but, you know, should we take a bit home each and we'll take a gamble? You know, if we get sick, that's fine. <laughs> you know, at least it's not the public. We've got to be the guinea pigs ourselves. And it was quite honestly one of the most delicious pieces of pork I've ever eaten in my life. And it was completely unexpected, incredibly nutty, um, really great density to it. Um, but just that nuttiness, it, but still quite fresh and quite sweet. It was really a revelation. And that's driven the confidence with us to keep pushing the envelope with that. Um, yeah, so now we serve them at around 50 to 60 days dry age the pork. I find that's a good spot for us where you've got a really good, strong density and a really great flavor. Um, but then we did an event for Embla last week. Well, with Embla, it was supposed to be a collabor- collaboration, but Dave couldn't actually get up because of the border restrictions. Um, in Melbourne, but he wanted us to use the pork. So he does a similar pork cutlet, but he only wanted to use it at two weeks. And I hadn't tasted it at two weeks for quite some time, and it was really, really delicious even still. But they're quite quite different. So, I mean, that's one process that's different that we do with the pork, um, which I think works really well. And then second dish that we do is a jowl that we smoke in the hot smoker. Um, so we just take some really good free-range pork jowls. We salt them down the day before and just a bit of salt and pepper, and then we put them in the hot smoker, usually over pecan or applewood. Um, we use for that, but then we chill it back down, slice it really thin, and then ribber it, ribbon it onto skewers and then cook it aggressively over the wood coals um, just to get it really nice and crunchy. Because it's so fatty, the pork, you know, you get that great crust, the great crunch on the outside, and then inside it's almost like butter, you know, just liquid we serve that with like a gentleman's relish that we make and a whole bunch of accompaniments and that goes into our set menus as sort of the last dish that comes out. Sort of like reminiscent of a dish that we used to do at Gerard's with beef brisket but sort of like a build-your-own little flatbread to finish the meal off. Um, that works really well. But, yeah, the cutlet to me, that dry-age cutlet is just incredible. The connections that you formed with farmers and the levels that you go to um, to try and get the best flavour out of pork is a little bit unique among among chefs. Do you have any tips on the best ways to to get the best out of pork when you're cooking it? Uh, I think you need to look at the cut. Um, you know, does it is it going to benefit from a gentle, slow cooking process, or is it going to gen- benefit from something hard and fast? You know, um, I think the older the animal gets and the larger it gets, the more gently you treat the piece of meat, the more you're going to get from it in the end. Whereas something smaller and you know just a quick a quick flash and then a, a rest is all that it requires. Like, I think that's the best way to put it. But then also just really look at where the pork comes from. Get to know the farmers. I think that's really important as well, who they are as people and how they approach the product, I think is important. Um, and go out to the farms and see the pigs, have a look at the processes and how they're made and raised. Um, find out about how they're killed as well. I think that's an important part that a lot of people overlook. You know, How do they get transported from A to B? What happens when they get to B? Um, I remember finding out through Vaughan uh, when we were doing the suckling pigs, there was we we're having an issue with uh, some of them coming in being bruised, you know, so it looked like they'd been beaten up. And essentially when we started talking to him, it was one of those things where if you have a pig that's smaller than the other pigs when they're getting transported, the other pigs actually bully them. They bully them on the ride, bash them up. You know, we were having them coming in with broken limbs and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, now from that and with us learning that together, Vaughan only transports, he, he's very selective with the pigs and how many that go and he makes sure they're all f- the same size, that they all get on well together and before he transports them because he cares about how the animal is by the end. You've had the most extraordinary uh, year with um, the opening of Agnes and Bianca and uh, adding Same Same and Honto to your restaurant portfolio. What's what's the next year or two look like for you? Uh, I don't know. If you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said that we are not going to stop. <laughs> we're just going to keep going and we're going to keep riding away for as long as we can. But honestly, lately, I feel like I need to take a bit of time and, and sit back and reflect on everything. But look, Bakery Agnes Bakery is going to open uh, early September, and so we're in the final stages of getting all of that together now. Um, I'm really excited about that because it's something different and something I haven't, you know, to actually do what we're doing in the pop up with 
the proper equipment and we built a big four ton scotch oven which is going to go into the site to do all that baking in and i'm really pumped to get in there and start cooking in that you know and that's all wood fired as well there's no gas or anything but we built it so it has a steam injection system so that we can get the most from the sourdough and yeah very custom but it's i'm pumped for that and then after that I guess there's another project that my business partner and I are looking at at the moment, which will be a huge project, and I'm really excited for that. I can't say anything about it, but um, if that one goes ahead and we do it, it'll be pretty um, pretty life changing for us. So I'm really excited about that too. Look, I don't think we're going to stop. Well, that sounds pretty exciting, and I'm sure it'll be amazing given what you've already given um, Brisbane and Australia um, through your career, Ben. Uh, you're extraordinary, and we've loved having you on the Crackling today to hear your story. Uh, keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, Huck. You too, mate. This is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.